Hello. Hello, one, two, three, four. Welcome everyone to Imagination Stations, Bug a Scientist. I'm very excited for this one because we're going to learn about some weird bugs. We've got Jack and Heidi here from the University of Toledo. They're entomologists and they're going to tell us all about some of these funky critters. Here we go. Jack and we are entomologists. And we love bugs. bugs. <laughs> Insects do lots of amazing things, which makes it hard to decide what's most weird or most amazing. But here are some of our favorites. Some insects are way bigger than we ever imagined. Take a look at the giant weta, a cricket relative. It weighs as much as two mice. The Titan beetle and the Herac uh, Hercules beetle and the Goliath beetle all vie for the heaviest larva of an insect. And then there's the giant stick insect. Isn't that beautiful? Two feet long. But how big can they actually get? Those are pretty impressive. Well, they are. They are record setters. Um, and actually, they can't get much bigger than that, even though you may find in movies that giant insects have emerged from nuclear test sites. I love and, those movies. <laughs> they are great fun to watch. But in reality, insects can't get any bigger than your hand, like the ones we show. And, and that's because, remember the way that insects breathe, we talked about before. 
They breathe through holes in the sides of their body, and then that air goes into and contacts every cell in their body eventually. No blood. No blood, not like us. And what that means is that they can only get so big. The system doesn't work when they get much larger than a hand. So no monster ants? <laughs> no monster ants, mm. which is sad and good. It's kind of a relief, <laughs> but I, I kind of was hoping, you know. Yeah, okay. I know. So that's, that's the large end. Mm -hmm. What's the small end of the scale? Ooh, the smallest flying insect that we know of is the Tinkerbell fairy fly. Isn't she beautiful? Wow. <laughs> it's so small that it can fit inside, well, inside a penny. So here you see a penny. And the Tinkerbell fairy fly could fit inside that zero wow. in 2013. It's so small. Wow. That is tiny. My goodness. What does it do for a living? Oh, it has a sweet name, right? Tinkerbell it fairy Tinkerbell, fly, yeah. named after the sidekick of Peter Pan. Right. But actually, it's a vicious egg predator. It's a parasitoid wasp that lays its eggs inside the eggs of other insects and eats those eggs out from the inside out. Isn't that sweet? It is. And insect eggs are really tiny, so she has to be she, really tiny. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. Pretty strange. So does she always look that way? Does she always look that way? Or does she change in some way to get there? Oh, yes. You're reminding me of my, one of my favorite amazing facts about insects, and that is metamorphosis, which just means change in form. Now, we change when we grow up, as we grow, but we look pretty much the same as we did as a kid. We don't have major changes in body plan. And think about a grasshopper. A young grasshopper looks like a grown-up grasshopper, although the grown-up grasshopper may have acquired wings along the way, but pretty much the same. Just like me. I look just like the way I was as a baby, especially... <laughs> the up, hair comes, up the there. hair goes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but the really amazing metamorphosis is the one that happens from caterpillars to butterflies. That's really different. That's really different. The local and the locomotion is different. The body plan is different. Everything's different. Yet, the caterpillar has the same genes as the butterfly. So how does it look so different? Well, that is because some genes are turned on and off. And in the caterpillar, the adult genes are turned off. And in the butterfly, the caterpillar genes are turned off. So it's amazing that the same set of genes can create different mm -hmm. organisms that look so different. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I can't imagine going through metamorphosis. Kafka did, but, yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah. I found going through adolescence a little disorienting, but not as weird as metamorphosis must be. That's pretty strange, but it, it helps insects be successful because one form can make a living one way and the other form another way. Mm -hmm. For example, caterpillars are eating machines that gather together the material to make the adult butterfly, which is charged almost entirely with mating to produce new caterpillars. So each of them has a job and, and this allows them to be successful that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, insects are successful in lots of different ways uh, and there are a few things that they do that we do, but insects actually do much better. Uh, Jumping is one of them. Boink. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> grasshoppers are pretty good jumpers. Mm -hmm. um, now, grasshoppers have a very small body. And we have a large body, so comparing the speed and so forth of the two really requires us to take that into account. So, a grasshopper can, can jump 171, uh, I'm sorry, uh, several times, many times, its body length. If we had the same jumping skill that a grasshopper did at our size, we'd be able to jump over an entire football field. Whoa! There are, however, some insects that are even better than that, okay? There's one that you really like. Oh, I really love the plant hoppers, which you probably know from their nymph form we call spittle bugs. Wait a minute, Jack. What are you doing? Whoa! 
God. I'm blowing bubbles to make spittle. <laughs> Just like the spittle bud does, but there's a difference. There it is on the left. The adult is on the right. The frog hopper. And there he goes, making, making spittle, making bubbles. The difference between what this insect is doing and what I did is that I did it with my mouth, but this insect is using its butt. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, to blow air in, oh. <laughs> in, into its, into its uh, excretions to make the, the, uh, the bubbles. The bubbles uh, protect it from drying out and from enemies. Now here we also see the, the adult jumping. That adult <clears throat> uh, jumps at 13,000 feet per second. Now if you, if you recall, when astronauts are going into space, they get squished into their seats by the acceleration. Uh, yeah. they, they experience three times the weight, the, the gravity pull, that they do normally on the planet, on the surface of the planet. So they experience what we call three Gs. Hmm. Okay? That insect, when it takes off, takes off, accelerates at such a high rate that it experiences over 400 Gs. Whoa! If our bodies were subjected to 400 Gs, we'd be squished. We'd be Yeah, we'd just be a puddle, you know. So that's pretty much the world champion jumper, huh. uh, although you have to take into account the fact that it's only, it's small, and it actually holds the, the height record for insects, which is about 36 inches. Huh. So, <laughs> so yeah. it jumps a yard. It jumps a yard, right, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but does it really fast. It does it really yeah. fast. <laughs> and how about flying? Well, um, I think. Oh, we want to do, how about running? We want to do running first, yeah. Um, here's a champion runner. Uh, this is a tiger beetle. You probably see this green one in your yard or, or around town. In fact, you'll see it on sidewalks. And uh, you'll see it running very, very fast and then stopping quickly, occasionally it flies. Uh, it, it is like a tiger. It stalks prey and then chases it and, and eats it. But what's curious about it is that you can see this little one here running across the sand and it stops from time to time. It runs fast and then it stops. And it runs fast and it stops. And the reason for that is that it runs so fast that it, it is blind when it runs. Its eyes cannot process the light from objects in its environment at that speed. Hmm. So what it has to do is it has to stop periodically to look around and take in its environment and figure out where the prey item is and then chase it again and then stop and then chase and then stop uh, otherwise, it, it uh, runs into things. Uh, in fact, if you, uh, the interesting thing is that if you blind one of these beetles uh, and let it run around, it, it does not run into things. And the reason for that is that it actually senses its environment with its antennae. Uh, it won't run into the wall as long as its antennae can feel the wall. Hmm. This insect runs at 171 body lengths per second. If a six-foot person ran that fast, 101, 171 body lengths per second, that person would be traveling at 720 miles per hour, which is just, just slightly less than the speed of sound. So it's a really fast beetle. Yeah. And again, like the previous example, it doesn't go very far, but uh, where it goes, it goes extremely fast, and faster than any human could possibly run. So you wanted yeah, to know. I wanted to know about flying. flying. And of course, that's something that uh, insects can do that we can't do. I mean, uh, I've tried, but I never get <laughs> off the ground, you know. Uh, <clears throat> but here's the master, uh, the insect master of flight. This is a dragonfly. Uh, and it has solved some of the problems that the running tiger beetle has. Uh, it has such massive eyes and such a large brain for processing visual things that it can see at extremely high speeds. About 80% of its brain is devoted to processing vision, and almost its entire head is made of eyes. Not only does that allow it to see things very fast, but it allows it to see everywhere around it, 360 degrees. There's only one blind spot directly behind, behind the insect. Um, it can travel 100 body lengths per second, a six-foot person traveling that fast would be moving at over 400 miles per hour. Uh, that would be 15 times faster than any human has ever been able to run. 
uh, and it's about half the speed of sound. So this is a really quick Whoa. one too. Uh, and it does that because it's, it's chasing and catching insects on the wing. Uh -huh. It's another predator trying to catch fast insect prey. Uh, so it's, but it's really the master of the skies. It's a fabulous machine, really. I would love to be a dragonfly. It would be cool. Yeah, <laughs> it would be cool. Mm -hmm. Now, insects have mastered something that I actually don't do very well, and that's weightlifting. Yeah, I know. It's, it's a good thing to do. <clears throat> it's good for you. But I, I don't do it very well. Okay. But here's somebody who does do it very well. <clears throat> this ant... The bottom, the ant on the bottom is carrying a rather heavy piece of leaf uh, and a sister ant riding on the leaf. Uh, ants in general can carry weights over 100 times their own body weight, so they are excellent lifters. This one is carrying a leaf that came from where? Why is it carrying this leaf? Ah, that's because ants are master farmers. In fact, they invented farming. And this ant has carved out a piece of leaf and is carrying it back to the colony. And you can see a, the ant removing pieces of leaf here, and they usually work in teams, and they can defoliate an entire tree over the course of a day or two when the colonies are large. And they take these back to the colony and feed them to a fungus garden which they've made, and it's the fungus that eats the leaves, and then the ants eat the fungus. So it's mushrooms or fungi for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the ants. And this is the first farm. This is over 100 million years old. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. So they, they really figured out how to do things that we've kind of copied later in our evolution. How about animal husbandry? They, they tend animals too? They do. So here are ants farming aphids. Aphids are the gray uh, insects on the plant, and they're sucking the plant sap. And they're exuding a sugary solution condensed from the plant sap. From and their butts again. <laughs> from their butts again, yes. And the ants are collecting that as a source of energy for themselves. And why would the aphids put up with this? Well, the, the aphids get in return some bodyguard protection from the ants, and the ants keep the aphid enemies away. And the ants will even move these aphids between plants to start a new colony. There, there are some species of ants that bring the aphids or related insects down into their nest for the winter. Yes. Yeah. Bring them into the barn to overwinter <laughs> and put them back out on the yeah. plants in the spring. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> and then there's one kind of, of ant farming, in a sense, that's very specific and common uh, uh -huh. that we can only find in Ohio, really. That it's the endangered <laughs> carner blue butterfly. It exists in a few other places, but its range has been condensed. And the Toledo Zoo is working on, on growing these and releasing them back into the wild to recover the population. But what you see there in the left-hand side is a slug-like caterpillar with a darker green stripe going down its back. And that caterpillar is exuding a sugary solution out its hind end, end <laughs> you know, special gland near there. And the ants are collecting that for energy. And in return, the ants are protecting the caterpillars from their predators. Hmm. So you can go out into the oak openings, and if you're lucky, and if you can, you can find this, you can actually see this happen. And you can see the other kinds of aphid farming uh, when you find aphids on plants. Right, it's actually mm -hmm. quite common. You should mm -hmm. be able to see it around your yard. Yep, yep. yep. So <clears throat> this is pretty fancy. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think the caterpillars are probably producing something that's chemically useful yeah. to the ant, right? So. Do insects do chemistry as a, you know, as a thing? Some insects are master chemists. And there's one that's very familiar now to you in the backyard this time of year. And these are fireflies. These are the males that you can see that arise above the ground. And different colors and different patterns are made by different species. The males are calling to females down on the ground who will signal back. And then the mating will happen. The fireflies are able to do this with a, a special chemical reaction in their abdomen with four different chemicals that are kept separate. But once they're mixed, they will then produce bioluminescence, that lovely firefly light we associate 
with summer in this part of the country. Now, there is some danger involved because there's one species of firefly in which the female, the, all fireflies are predators. So the female firefly of this species has learned to imitate the flash patterns of males in the areas in which they live, and they will flash that pattern. The male will think it's a female of his species, will come in, and then the other female of the different species eats them. Ooh. So there's, there's some danger, and you have to get your signals right. Oh, that's, that's unsafe. <laughs> unsafe, for sure. There's another master chemist that we don't see quite as often, um, and that's the bombardier beetle. This beetle ejects boiling acid out its butt again. <laughs> that's a theme today. <laughs> and it can, it can aim that boiling acid in any direction to get the predator. And as you can see, they're deterred. Comes from a special gland, again, in the abdomen, where three separate chemicals are kept, that are very explosive when, when uh, mixed are kept separate. And when needed, they are mixed together in a special chamber, and then it's blasted out. 200 it, degrees of boiling acid. That wouldn't be pleasant. No, no. It, it works pretty well. I mean, uh, otherwise the beetle would get eaten by things, that spider paid the price, yes. right? Uh, so insects do have to defend themselves. It's, uh, you know, they're kind of little and birds and mm -hmm. entomologists are always after them, you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, but there are, you know, less violent ways to escape being eaten by things. And insects are masters of disguise as a mm -hmm. subtler way to escape their enemies. They can even become sort of invisible. This is a, a glass-winged butterfly. Uh, and when you're in the forest looking for these, uh, it's essentially not there. It's very, very difficult to see because you can see right through it. Uh, and this is designed uh, for the butterfly to escape the eye of birds or lizards uh, that are searching for it. Masters of disguise means that insects are excellent mimics of items that no bird or lizard would want to eat in the environment. On the left side, you see a caterpillar mimicking a stem that it's resting on. The caterpillar is on the right, the stem is on the left. And the two twigs in the lower right part of this picture are actually caterpillars. Uh, I have to admit that I am stunned by this, this particular caterpillar. It's almost impossible to tell that that's a caterpillar, not a twig. Although the chances of seeing two identical twigs together probably <laughs> in the same leaf are not good. But, uh, but it's, it's an incredible job of mimicking uh, an inedible part of the environment. Wow. You can also just hide, <clears throat> disappear on the background. There's a caterpillar on this leaf. Can you see it? Well, there it is. It has a stripe down its back that matches the stripe on the plant. And it has these filamentous processes that, uh, that stick out from the sides. And the whole thing gives the impression of a flat surface of a leaf. And it's really difficult to see if you're out in nature. The idea of mimicking things, of course, is to mimic something that no bird or other predator wants to eat. And one thing that birds certainly don't want to eat is their own poop. Uh, and here we have one, two, three, four pictures of poop. Well, actually, the only poop in this picture is that. All three of the others are insects mimicking poop. This is actually a really pretty common uh, disguise that insects use, and it probably works really well because there really hardly is anything in the environment that's out there looking for uh, bird poop to eat. <clears throat> if all else fails, then threaten your enemies. This snake is actually a caterpillar that when threatened <clears throat> opens its fake eyes the eyes, by the way, are, are not on the head. The head is to the left of the eyes of this picture. Blows up that part of its body with the eyes expanding and pretends to be a snake. <laughs> wow. Uh, scientific experiments, uh, putting these in cages with birds, show that uh, when a bird sees this happen, it jumps back and uh -huh. is not anxious to attack. Well, I would, too. I would, too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it is seem to rule the world of, of mimicry. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of katydids, which are related to grasshoppers, uh, that do fantastic 
fantastic uh, mimicry of, of their environments. Uh, the Katy did in the upper left, you can see its long antennae, is uh, resting on a leaf that is diseased and damaged. And the Katy did is mimicking that. Uh, now, the Katy did was born that way. It, it isn't diseased, it isn't damaged. Uh, but a green leaf with that kind of disease is common enough in its environment that it grows up to mimic that particular disease. Wow. The one in the lower right has been eaten. Well, actually, it hasn't been eaten, but it looks just like a leaf that has been eaten. Uh, and again, it's, it's a, almost a perfect match for leaves that actually exist in the environment and have holes in them. Hmm. It's, it's really an amazing, amazing feat. There's a Katie did in this picture. Can you see it? No? Raise your hand. <laughs> well, there it is. Uh, this Katie did lives on this particular kind of background and matches it almost perfectly. It's, it's practically impossible when you're out there looking for it to, to find it. This Katie did is mimicking the colors of a leaf that is, that is only red for a short period of time during its life. So evidently, its favorite leaf is red long enough to make it worthwhile for a kitty did to be this color to escape its predators. But you know, there's another thing here. That is just a gorgeous insect. And even if it, there weren't an, ex, you know, an ecological explanation for this color thing, I just knocks my eye off. <laughs> it's just, just gorgeous. And that's something that's true of so many insects. You know, they're trying to make a living, but while they're doing it, they're really contributing to our aesthetic environment. <laughs> Indeed. In fact, we have some rather plain but good-sized green katydids around here that yep. will call in late summer mm -hmm. and fall, and you'll hear them go. Ch -ch 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 yeah, like yeah they night. look like leaves. Yeah, and you may find them on plants when you're wandering about. Okay. Well, we're sad to say that this is our fourth and last bug of scientists. We hope you've enjoyed this as much as we have. We also hope that you've come to love and appreciate insects a little more than when we started. Oh, but not too much. This isn't ah. too much. Bye -bye. See ya. Jack and Heidi, thank you so much for coming down to Imagination Station and doing Bug a Scientist with us. If you guys at home are interested in learning more about bugs, you can go to our YouTube page and find all the previous Bug a Scientist videos and learn along with us all. Thank you so much and have a great night.